Roses are red, violets are blue. We hope you enjoyed this little review. There will be language that may be explicit, so keep out of reach of little kids. Also, there may be spoilers galore for the Sailor Moon franchise and another movie for sure. Last but not least, most important of all, the opinions expressed do not reflect dub talk as a whole. Now sit back and relax, enjoy the future presentation, while the glare sparkles from Moon Princess Halation. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Dub Talk, where tonight a couple of Moonies get together to discuss the latest dubs and theatrical releases. That's right, tonight we delve into another movie as part of Dub Talk's Summer at the Movies. My name is Jamal and for tonight you can call me Tuxedo Mask. And joining me on this lovely adventure is my Princess Serenity from Anime Palooza, it's Gigi. Oh, that was so cute! <laughs> Points for Jamal. Know, right? Jamal's winning points. Everybody needs to catch up. <laughs> yeah. And in case you couldn't tell, tonight we'll be covering the Viz Media dub for Sailor Moon R, the movie, The Promise of the Rose. Based on the 1991 manga series, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, by Naoko Takeuchi. This has been a moment over two decades in the making. Now, for those of you new to the Sailor Moon franchise, or for longtime fans of the show, here's a synopsis for you. Long before Mamoru found his destiny with, with Usagi, he gave a single rose in thanks to a lonely boy who helped him recover from the crash that claimed his parents. This long forgotten friend, Fiore, has been searching the galaxy for a flower worthy of that sweet gesture long ago. That mysterious flower he finds is beautiful, but it has a dark side. It has the power to take over planets. To make matters worse, this strange plant is tied to an ominous new asteroid near Earth. Faced with an enemy blooming out of control, it's up to the Sailor Moon and the Sailor Guardians to band together to stop the impending destruction and save Mamoru. Now we will be discussing Viz's cast from top to bottom because Studiopolis's crediting system is nonsense. Oh my god. As well as give- yeah. <laughs> as well as give our thoughts on the performance in the movie as a whole. Now, this since this is a dub review, there will be no predictions, because it would be stupid at this point. <laughs> it really would. And as always, we're going to start with the ADR director and scriptwriter. ADR director is Suzanne Goldish. While the scriptwriter is Seth Walther, Suzanne Goldish, of the work she's directed, she has directed the 100 episodes of Bleach, K and K Missing Kings, Tiger and Bunny, as well as the majority of the Sailor Moon franchise. Oh my god. Oh yeah. <laughs> that girl's gonna never be out of a job for the next like three years. I know, right? <laughs> I as for Seth Walt, the other works he's written for is Bobo Bo 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 Season 2. He's written for Digimon from Season 2 of Adventure to Data Squad. Ugh. <laughs> he's also written for K Missing Kings, Naruto, and of course, Sailor Moon and Sailor Moon R. So, what are our thoughts on the director and scriptwriter? Oh, Lord. Well, okay, let me preface this before we jump into everything by the fact that you and I, I think, are the biggest Moonies in dub talk. And uh, I've been watching Sailor Moon since I was a kid. And I have a big nostalgia boner for this franchise. And I have an even bigger nostalgia boner for this movie. Like, this is my favorite Sailor Moon movie to the point where I can practically recite it in Japanese. So uh, while I have seen the original dub of this movie, um, my forte for this is actually the Japanese. So if I make a lot of comparisons between the Sailor Moon dub that we have now and the Japanese, that's why. Because everything I love about this movie 
I love because of the Japanese dub. Now, not to say that the old dub isn't great too, but I'll get to that when we get to it. Um, but so as for the directing and the writing of this, I mean, there's really not a whole lot to, to touch on. It's, it's very true. It's very true to the original Japanese uh, to the point where I turned the subtitles on and it was almost dub titles the way they were going at it. Um, I have a couple of points that I want to talk about, but I mean, what do you think about it as a whole? Uh, well, to be honest, I kind of went into this blind because even though I've been a big Mooney since I was a kid, I never really got to see the movie until earlier this year. Like really? I was only, I was only seven when the franchise came out. I know I'm just dating myself here, but I only <laughs> ever saw, I've only ever seen like the first two seasons, and then it kind of pretty much died down for like fifteen years or so. Once I started picking up again, I made it a habit to, like, see his, pretty much the entire franchise. I mean, and it, my love for it still holds strong. So when I saw the movie, I was I was very impressed with the story. Even though it's an only, only an hour-long film, it still managed to capture the spirit of the Japanese, as far as I can tell. Yeah, it definitely doesn't need more than an hour just to tell this little snippet of a story that we have here. Um, to the point where I can always tell the part where I'm going to get emotional. It's around 40 minutes in, in case you were wondering, where I start to cry like Ugh. an asshole. Oh, my God. When she starts ripping those flowers out of that mountain, uh, I just, I'm done. Um, but there were a few couple of points, like, in the Japanese that I was just really hoping that they would keep in the show. And other than one, I think it was very... Um, very true to it like the one I was really hoping for was and this is like a huge a directing choice and a writing choice also is when um, they're fighting that first flower monster and Usagi gets like thrown into that empty cafe or something and remember when Chibiusa is like on top of her and she like covers her mouth so she can't breathe you know what I'm talking about yeah that's like and there's like no sound for like seven seconds like that's in the japanese and like every time <laughs> every time i watched it i thought my poor dvd was broken <laughs> i called my dad and i was like why is why is nothing happening and he's like just wait for it wait for it little gg little baby gg wait for it and then all of a sudden she'll start to breathe again so i'm so happy they decided to stick true to that and not put any kind of noise or any kind of talking whatsoever in there and then the other thing um i just want to touch on really quickly is when they're in the um i don't know whose house they're in maybe ray's house who knows when they're all talking together like yeah. at the table and there's and yeah and ami's like talking about like oh i guess mamoru is popular with the boys as well and in the japanese like it gets like they call her like perverted it's really funny and in this they didn't do that so i was like <laughs> they like really tried to pc that up like oh like i heard him in the background and they were like oh i have people at my school who are in that kind of relationship and somebody else was like really and i was like wow you really like pc'd that <laughs> viz so uh <laughs> I, I, definitely a writing choice there because in the japanese um ray called ami perverted and i was like oh god that's hysterical to me um, but I mean, other than that, there's nothing really special about it. Um, I didn't like the translation of Ray's, um, Akuyo Taisan, which now it's like evil spirits yeah. be exercised or something. And then yeah. ugh, like the pronunciations are so different from what I'm used to. I was just like. I know that's a Japanese thing. Like, they have to get it approved by the Japanese um, licensors and everything. But just, oh, and that's, but that's my way with every California dub. It seems like, like the pronunciations aren't what I feel they should be in, like, sitting right next to the Japanese talking. But. Yeah, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. I think that, yeah, it's more of a mandated choice. 
But for me, sometimes it also tends to be LA dubs in general. Like sometimes it can be a little jarring compared to the Japanese. But you know, not every dub's gonna hit it right exactly. You know, there's always gonna be some kind of deviation. Exactly, and and I have a confession to make. Is this is like the first time I've listened to the uh, the new dub of Sailor Moon, even though I own it all. This is the first time I've actually listened to it, other than like three episodes of Crystal. So, this is my first time hearing all these these characters, and oh man, <laughs> oh man. Yeah. <laughs> And speaking of the new dub, let's move on to pretty much our first batch. We have Artemis and we have Luna. They are both loyal servants to the Silver Millennium family. Artemis trained Minako as Sailor V and has remained by her side ever since. Luna is training Yusagi as both a guardian and as a princess. Both have a sibling relationship with their master as well as romantic feelings towards each other. Uh, pretty much the, besides Ami, they're the brains of the team, if you will. They don't, they take, oh fuck, why, why am I back? Pretty much the, when the whole situation with the asteroid arises, they pretty much have a sneaking suspicion that evil is afoot. And sometimes they'll command their team to transform, although, you know, that's a 90s thing. <laughs> and, yeah. And so, Artemis is voiced by John Young Bosch, while Luna is voiced by Michelle Ruff. John Young Bosch, you would most likely recognize him as Ichigo Kurosaki from Bleach, Lelouch from the Code Geass franchise, Hajime Hinata from Danganronpa, Faster Stampede from Trigun, but his most famous work is, of course, is Adam Park from Power Rangers. <laughs> oh, yes, the He's Black Ranger Strikes Again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as for Michelle Ruff, other works you've seen her in is as Wukia Kuchiki in Bleach, Yoko Littner from Gurren Lagan. Fujiko Mine from Lupin the Third, Part 2, 4, Mystery Mamo, and The Woman Called Fujiko Mine, as well as Crimson Viper from Street Fighter 4 and 5. Now, what do we think of the two Guardian cats? The, the Captain Expositions that we have here? Yeah, pretty much. Um, Johnny Young, <laughs> Johnny Young Bosch, by the way, plays my favorite JoJo. JoJo, just saying. Um, ah, yes. See, and here, I barely I barely have any notes about them. Um, they didn't really have a whole lot to do in this movie, except for being Kitty Captain Expositions. And to, to be quite honest with you, here's where my nostalgia is going to happen, especially in these damn cats. I really miss Luna talking like a drunk Mary Poppins in the original dub. That's what she sounded like. And Artemis sounded like, like an old an old nerdy dude. And I was like, Artemis isn't nearly as nerdy enough. And Luna isn't nearly as Mary Poppins enough. And I know in the Japanese, Luna sounds like normal. She's like a teenage girl. But I, I can't get behind the new ones. They did fine. They did fine for what they had. But for somebody who grew up with this, I just, I miss them. I, I wish they would have done something a little bit different or like to make them stand out and they just kitty exposition. Yeah, I have a feeling you and I are gonna be butting heads a lot tonight. We because are where I stand from a <laughs> because where I stand from a nostalgia standpoint, I thought Artemis in the original dub was okay. He sounded like he had a bit you gotta keep in mind, I was seven when I heard the original dub. So Artemis sound, sounded like he had a bit of a Brooklyn accent, and that was a little off-putting. And Luna, I didn't like her at all, because Luna, it, it sounded strange to me as a kid, and then when I go back to listen to it, it still sounds strange <laughs> to me, it still sounds off-putting, but that was the way they marketed it, because they, they thought, hey, you know, a British voice would be good this time, I mean, Mary Poppins is around, so why not? Exactly. And, you know, you I don't know, even know how old. Sorry, I don't even know how old I was when I was watching this. I just knew that I watched it a lot 
and uh, I had like I had everything like on tape like tapes from somebody else that were given to me and I was like what is this so I mean that's probably why where it comes from All I know is I was watching it on UPN back in the day and I didn't even know it was on Toonami I didn't even know Toonami was a thing back then like I didn't either <laughs> But, you know, I mean, back then, if I had to listen to the original dub, I probably still would have found, found it off-putting. But as for the new dub, you know, they did a pretty good job. Just wish I could have heard a bit more. Yeah. And in, in the earlier episodes, like in season one of the series, there it's all Kitty Exposition. It's all Luna and Artemis all the time. So I have a feeling, like, once we go back and watch that, we'll get a better sense of who they are as their characters. But... In here, there wasn't a lot to talk about, and for me, I was just on a nostalgia binge and really kind of missing, missing the crappy British accent. Let's move on now to <laughs> <laughs> pretty much uh, two characters who have an unhealthy obsession with Mamoru, and one character that has an obsession with our antagonist. I'm talking about Chibiusa, Fiore. And the Ksenian flower. Chibiusa is pretty much... She looks to be like a little seven-year-old girl, but she's actually 900 years old. Who traveled back in time from Crystal Tokyo. We, we got... Before before I move on, we got to warn everybody. There will be spoilers, not just for parts of Sailor Moon, but parts of Sailor Moon R. In case you couldn't tell by the title. <laughs> So Chibiusa came back in time from Crystal Tokyo to rescue her parents and her friends who at the time thought it was a good idea to try and steal the silver crystal from Usagi. Keep in mind she's a kid. She doesn't know any better yet. And so she pretty much has an air about her that she wants to be strong but lacks the power to do so. And then you have uh, Fiore, who is a long-lost childhood friend of Mamos, who's actually here from another planet. Who's so determined by his friendship that he allowed him to get possessed by a flower he found on another planet. And developed an intense hatred towards Sailor Moon. He's determined to whisk Mamo away so they can be together forever. This sounds like a voice love kind of moment. B-L, B-L, yaoi, yaoi, Gigi's yaoi corn. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I got carried away. I'm all for B-L, even though this show, uh, now that I've seen it, is kind of weird. <laughs> I still love it. This this part right here is like, a, like there are like sort of slashy points in here but like this part right here is like super tuxedo mask bl which we don't get a lot of so i'm taking it and i'm running straight to the bank deal and of course we have the zenian flower who this, whose main power is to feed on the energy and hatred of people while pretty much pitting friendship against each other in a sense and so Chibiusa is voiced by Sandy Fox. Fiore is voiced by Ben Diskin. And the Xenian Flower is voiced by Carrie Karenin. To go over other roles, Ch Sandy Fox is flooring the asterisk war. She's Haruna from Dura Ra Ra. And she's detaching comas from Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. Ben Diskin. He's also Joseph Joestar from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Bond from the, yeah, Bond from the Seven Deadly Sins, and Gurio Umino from the Sailor Moon franchise. I hate him. Really? I hate him. I can't stand him. No, he's really. He's Umino? a no. Yes. Oh sh! I fuck. Maybe I should watch season one. Yes, uh, like I said, he has tends to have a bit of a nerdy voice, so it kind of makes sense here. As for Carrie Karenin, she's Casca and Berserk, the original Berserk dub, Mahiru Koizumi from Danganronpa, Ron from Hyperdimension Neptunia, 
Mami Tomoe from Madoka Magica. She's Lila from Tales of Sis. She's Lila from Tales of Sis. She's Lila from Tales of Sestiria and Hiroko Seto from Yulai in April. So, let's begin. Alright, well, I guess we'll talk about the demon spawn first. Cause I why knew not? you were going to say that. You knew I was going to say that. I don't like Chibiusa. However, however, let me give this up to Sandy Fox. Big props. I did not hate this Chibiusa in this movie with her voicing. Chibiusa. Like, I felt that she was an actual tiny small child instead of somebody who came from 900 years in the future and knows her way around the block and had that um, black lady still in her. So I was like, okay, okay, Sandy Fox, I can get behind you doing this 1000%. And me, who dislikes Chibiusa more than any other character in this whole franchise... (laughs) I liked her w- with this performance in this movie. Like, I got behind Chibiusa. I thought she was a cute little kid. I'll never say that again. So, take it and run, Jamal. Take it and run. <laughs> and the bass keeps running, 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 running. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 de- I definitely agree with you there. I think, I forget who said it was, but you can judge how well an actor does their performance by how much you, it makes they make you want to punch them. I think that was I think that was y'all when you did kiss him, not me. It might have been. Sounds I accurate. Think so. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to punch cheap use. I mean, I love that pink sugary ball of fluff. You know. I mean, I I can understand how annoying she can be. I mean, I used to be a kid once upon a time. I was very annoying. <laughs> but but you know, I could. Oh, I better phrase this properly. I can see part of my kid personality in her, and I can relate to what she's trying to go through. Okay, there, that sounds better. There, that sounds good. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I just, in the English dub and in the Japanese, I've always disliked Chibiusa, just couldn't stand her. So to have her be played to the point where I actually like her and during the English dub now, I cried like a bitch when I watched it in Japanese 40 minutes to the end. The only part that I teared up while watching this dub was when she's on the roof. Chibiusa is on the roof. And she said, Sailor Moon is everyone's mom. And then I lost yeah. it. I lost it. I was like, oh, she is everyone's mom. Thank God. Why is Chibiusa making me cry? I don't understand my life right now. Um, but yeah. That she and she also actually sounds like her and Usagi belong together, like they sound related, which is something that I never got from any dub. Even when the Japanese voice of Chibiusa stepped in and played Usagi for two episodes in the original Japanese, never did I feel like their voices were similar at all. But here, I really felt that they were family and they were related. So. I mean, Sandy Fox is getting all my props here. Like, seriously, I, this is probably going to be the highest props for, well, maybe. I'll keep you in suspense. All right, then. With that being said, let's move on to Ben Diskin. What do you think of him? Ah, <sighs> Ben Diskin. Fiore. Fiore. Like, I'm, like, on the fence with this because... When he was human, I didn't feel the same amount of danger and I I didn't feel the same amount of dread when he was like the human for the few couple minutes at the beginning. But when he turned into the alien, oh my god, that's when like the switch turned on. He was so much better when he was alien Fiore. And then when he became red Fiore at the end, forget about it. He was like sexy bad. I was like, drop the mic. Yes, please turn my planet into a million flowers. I don't care. Whatever you want, Fiore. Whatever you want. But I mean, it was it it was good. It like there definitely was a point where I feel he turned the switch on, and once he got to that point, I believed it. Plus Fiore, plus Memora, forever, be all for life. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I agree with you there. Cause to me, he sounded like if Bryce no no off- no offense to the actor I'm about to mention here, but he sounds like if Bryce Pappenberg could be emotional. Right? He had that. <laughs> he had the. He had the same tone as Bryce Pappenberg, but he was able to tackle the emotional scenes, as well as tackle the obsessive tendencies that Fiore has. Now, I, I mean, I, I have a question for you. First of all, I couldn't find credits on my Blu-ray at all. So I don't know if they were actually there. But does Bryce Yeah. Does Bryce Pappenbrook voice Baby Mamo or Baby Fiore? Uh no, I think that's all No, Baby Fiore was Ben Diskin as well. Baby Mamo is Mamo's voice actor. As for the credits, however, there is a very good explanation for that. We'll go for you it. You see, you see, in order to find out, because I didn't know this till about yesterday. In order to find out who the scriptwriter was for the show, because a and n did not have it for some reason. <laughs> I found out about a digital version, and I paid a certain amount of money on my Xbox just to watch the digital version, which does have the English credits. Where the hell are the English credits on the Blu-ray? Like I, I went, I went everywhere. I couldn't find They're them. They're not. That's really They're kind not. of bogus, Viz. Can we? I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering how much of it was Viz and how much of it was Toei, because you know, as Hardy would say, Toei is kooky. Although I have a few choice words with Toei, but we're not going to mention that on the podcast. <laughs> Well, I mean, they always could do what Sentai does when they put the black box at the end of every episode and just roll their credits. Um, the other thing that I found really weird with this release, and we'll get back to talking about the dub in a second, was that the restoration into HD was so, like, jarring. The colors were so bright. I couldn't read the subtitles. The subtitles were, like, in terrible white with barely any outline. I couldn't fucking read them. I had to go back to my old DVD copy just to watch it in Japanese and read the subtitles because I couldn't, I couldn't read them. Yeah, I mean, while I like the HD remaster, I, Toei has a track record for being inconsistent with this stuff. Just ask any Dragon Ball fan or Precure fan, they'll tell you. Uh, let's not talk about how I can't get my hands on dragon boxes. I want them so bad. Um, anyway, but yeah, back to, uh, back to the dub at hand. Um, Baby Mamo and Baby Fiore, both of them sounded like Bryce Pappenbrook, which is why I asked that, which I thought was really funny that you said that. (laughs) I thought one of them was Bryce Pappenbrook. (laughs) No, believe it or not, he did make an appearance in the season one, but that's pretty much it. I'm hoping he comes back for season four. Anyway, moving on. Carrie Karenin. And as this little possessive flower, who I pretty much want to take some weed whacker to, what do you think of her? (laughs) Carrie, how was your time playing the sexy weed whacker? Oh my god. She was was sexy. She was evil enough. She had a nice nice death. Like, I liked that part when she died. I mean, not that she died, but, you know, like, it was... I felt it. I felt her dying, as a little sexy flower should. Um, I just wish it were more consistent the way that they pronounce the name of the flower, because in English, they pronounce it completely differently. Like, they pronounce it Kisenian. And everywhere else, it's always been Zenian. So I'm like... But she has nothing to do with that. Um, little sexy flower A plus. I liked the little effects that they used on her voice. Yeah, even though she wasn't on screen, uh, even though she didn't have as much time on screen, I did like a I did like her performance for what it was, especially when she possesses Fiore. And it, I'm not even gonna ask. <laughs> and I was surprised at like how much of the content was uh, kind of sexual. I was like, "Wow!" Right? <laughs> I was like, "Ooh, snap! Yeah. I don't remember this. <laughs> I must have blocked it out." But yeah, it was just a hardcore little flower man talking about spreading their seeds and shit everywhere. Yikes! Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I liked okay. I like I like the bad guys in this movie. I mean, we only get really two bad guys, and I I don't think they're forgettable like a lot of the monsters of the week are in most of the Sailor Moon stuff that we get. So yeah, ain't got for that. <laughs> Alright, so general consensus is the performance are pretty good. Even though some of the characters are not. So <laughs> <laughs> So let's move on to pretty much the main cast and we're gonna start with these Ailer Senshi. <laughs> Woo! Let's do this. Alright, alright, get your get your transformation phrase ready. Here it comes, kids. First up. We have Sailor Venus, also known as Sailor V, Sailor v. which according to the story is the original leader of the team. She possesses the power of love, insert Deke song reference here. She's the, she's the first person to actually be awoken by Artemis. I tend to think that she and Usagi uh, kind of sisters because they're both blonde. They both tend to be a bit of a klutz. Although one's not a crybaby. And she's very gung-ho when it comes to a mission. When it comes to any mission in general. And so Sailor Venus is of course yeah. played by Shermie Lee. Uh, the works you might have seen her in is she's also Takeshita from Begada HK. She's Elizabeth Medford from the Black Butler franchise. She's Lucy Hartfilia from Fairy Tale. Lick, Lichten, <laughs> Lichtenstein from Italia. And Patty Thompson from Soul Eater. So, what are your thoughts on Sailor Venus? Sailor Venus. Sailor Venus is my favorite inner. I love her. When I was a kid, I thought I was Sailor Venus. I looked just like her, except I was fatter. I was like, oh my god. I was like, why is she my life? Anyway, oh, so I guess we're going to talk. <sighs> we're going to talk about the uh, the dub of this. Yeah, okay. So, uh, like with Sailor Venus, also I ranked how everyone did their transformation yells because I'm an asshole like that. Um, she was the one I felt did the best job transforming into sailor venus i felt it i felt her edge and one thing that i don't normally feel when i listen to sheremy lee is that she has an edge i think she's very sweet and the only time i've ever heard her um actually have like this mean girl kind of thing going on and it isn't even really like a mean girl but like is sai and peach girl i won't talk to <laughs> Why did you have to mention Peach Girl? Because I just watched it. <laughs> but um, y you're welcome, Noah. <laughs> yeah, Noah's gonna be like, "What?" Um, but I, I felt the edge with her here. I felt her edge in Sailor Venus. I felt that she was like the warrior, ready to go, which a lot of people peg Ray for. But honestly, I always think it's Minako. And I really enjoyed her as Sailor Venus. I liked her better than the Nostalgia dub, which, again, is about as high as I can go right now. Yeah, that's good. That's pretty good. I, 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 from what I barely remember of the old dub, I do think Shermie Lee did a better job as Sailor Venus. I mean, that's not to discount the old actor. You know, it's just it was a product of his time. Shelmy Lee hit pretty much all the right notes for me. And I was actually even surprised, like when they announced the the new cast for the original dub. I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> like you Cause know, what a lot. Of t Sorry, go ahead. Cause, cause I was, cause this was probably one of the first times I ever figured out that Shelmy Lee moved to LA, uh, buying a, another series that I'd rather not mention on this program because a lot of people hate it. But yeah, I did find she did a very good job overall in this role and I really love to see more of it. Yeah, she she has everything going for her to be like the perfect Sailor Venus. And I mean, it made me forget about the old one. 
it had notes of the Japanese performance in there, which is always good, which so I can see why they cast her. But Jeremy Lee is knocking out of the park. I think she's adorable. Like I really like Jeremy Lee, so I was very I was very happy to see her in this anime in any way possible. And then the fact that she's like my favorite inner senshi, I was like, Yes, girl, queen. So very impressed. Very impressed. I'm giving you the V right now for victory. <laughs> you can't see it. But I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm just very sad and very sorry I couldn't get an autograph at AB. Me too. I missed her the entire time. Yeah, her and uh, the actor for Tuxedo Mask, which we'll be getting into. But general consensus, we love Jeremy in this role. You pretty much getting high marks from Gigi, girl, because you're her, you're playing her favorite inner senshi. Yeah, V, say la V. Good job. Now we're gonna get to my inner favorite inner senshi. <laughs> Here comes the thunder. It's Sailor <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh man, this. Just talking about her is going to put some sparkling white pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much, and I'm going backwards in case I haven't realized, pretty much she was the fourth guardian to join the team. Even though Sailor Venus was originally the first to awaken, she was the fourth guardian to join the team. Her power is pretty much, she controls lightning and thunder. In a civilian form, uh, she has a huge green thumb and a love for cooking. But when she gets down to business, she is pretty much the sh the strength behind the team, if you will. She'll back her friends up when the time calls for it. And so, Sailor Jupiter is voiced by Amanda C. Miller. Um, are the works Amanda Miller is voiced? She is, of course... Boruto from Boruto Naruto the movie. For Andrew, she's Soli and Cherchi from Fire Emblem, Junko and Toko from Danganronpa the game, as well as Young Seiko from Danganronpa 3. And she's Conway A. Mercury from Blaze Blue Chrono Phantasma. So, what, what are the thoughts on uh, Sailor Jupiter? You know what? I'm actually going to go first. Yeah, cause... I was like, you talk about your best girl first. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much when I first heard Amanda Miller in this role, I actually pretty much liked it like right off the bat. And then somehow, actually no, through a con, I think it was Emerald City Comic Con, I saw Susan Roman, who was the original voice of Sailor Jupiter. Yes. And when I heard her, when I heard her perform this role, I was like, wow, that's amazing. I think... Uh, Amanda cap managed to capture the spirit of the original while putting her own slight touch on it, you know. It still st it stays true to both the Japanese and the original dub. I don't I don't know if they ever replaced her in the Cloverway dub cuz I was too young to remember the rest of the show. Um but I think she did a very very good job as far as I could tell. You know, I'm really glad you said that because all that I wrote down for her was it sort of sounds like the old Jupiter, but it sounds like a new Jupiter at the same time because she has this little gravelly rattle in her voice. I know that sounds weird, but if you if you listen to the nostalgia dub, like y you know what I'm talking about. Like Sailor Jupiter doesn't sound like anybody else. And Amanda C. Miller puts like hints of that in her performance, so it doesn't like sound 100% like the old one it sounds like you know her her own Sailor Jupiter with just that little hint to keep assholes like me who love the old dub <laughs> you know content I thought she did an amazing job I really I really did I'd never heard her in anything before that I can remember off the top of my head so I was like who's this girl like I, I I've never heard you in anything um, but I really liked what she did with it, how she kept a little bit of the old in there and then made Jupiter all her own. So I was super happy with it. 
and her transformation was pretty good. I gave it like a a little bit above the nostalgia yell for for my sake. So I really liked it. And I'm glad you say that because one thing about Amanda Miller as as well as I'm I will I wanna say most of the senshi, Amanda Miller, her favorite senshi is of course Sailor Jupiter. So when Aww. she got to perf- so when she got to perform as her, she was very excited. And you can see how much dedication went into that. She really did. I felt I feel like she did her homework. Like like I feel like she went back and I don't know if she did this, but to me it feels like she went back and watched some of the old one just to see how it was and then put like the tiniest parts of it in there maybe that's just how she is because like I said I haven't heard her voice anyone else ever that I can that I could peg but I was super happy with it I've met her twice in person that believe believe it or not that's how she actually kind of sounds really yeah she's yeah she's pretty cool oh that's cool good job Amanda C. Miller you're like you're good. You're cool, girl. I'll buy you a drink. Yeah. All right. So, of course, general consensus we love this performance very much. Some more than others. <laughs> Best so girl. let's move on. Yeah. So let's move on now to, uh, uh, of course, the one dealing the Ofuda, the Ikyo Tyson, Sailor Mars. Of course, Sailor Mars' uh, power is pretty much the power of flame as well as the power of divination. She's pretty much a psychic. Uh, but also a bit of a hothead, especially when it comes to dealing with Usagi and her childish nature at times. But deep down inside, she has heart. And it shows. And so Sailor Mars is voiced by Christina V. And other roles you might have seen her in, she's Louise from The Familiar of Zero, Noel Vermillion from Blaze Blue, of course, Kilwa Zodic from Hunter x Hunter 2011, Kotori Minami from Love Life, Velvet Crow from Tales of the... <laughs> <laughs> Every time! Velvet Crow from Tales of Sisteria the Cross, and Koharu Seto from Your Lie in April. So, what are our thoughts? Sailor Mars, Sailor Mars. She has the best song, by the way. Her best BGM, Sailor Mars. Always Sailor Mars. Uh, okay, before we talk about Christina via Sailor Mars, I just want to say something here. Maybe it's just me, but I found that little... BGM during the transformation sequence a little off-putting. Really? Just a tiny bit. You know, it's... I mean, it was... I'm so used to it that if I don't hear, like, them singing in it, like, it just makes me sad. I'm like, why are they not singing in it? Because in the, the nostalgia dub, they don't. Yeah, I, I can understand it. I like it, too. It's just that for the scene, you know, when they stop battling. Oh, it's... yeah. It does kind of take you out of it. But one of the one of the big things, like, I guess when the movie first aired was that people were going to get to see all new animation for the transformation scenes. And I don't don't quote me on this, but I think they might have redone the music, too, just for the movie. So... That was, like, a big deal. Like, I remember watching it, and I was like, it's so different from what's on TV. Oh, my God. I was... Baby Gigi was, <coughs> was very excited by those transformation scenes. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Sailor Mars, Christina V. I, first of all, I was so afraid that I was going to hear Killua through the whole thing. Because nah. that's what I know Christina V from. However... Um, I didn't, so I was very excited about that. Um, and actually, she is the closest sounding to the nostalgia dub. Like she nailed sounding exactly, almost like perfectly, how the the first Sailor Mars did. I don't. I didn't 
watch it like once the second half of R kicked in and S once they dubbed that. Yeah, no, I wasn't touching that with a 10 foot pole. Um, but she sounded closest to original Sailor Mars. So I was like, yes. I was like, nostalgia is happening. The glitter, the sparkles, it's so wonderful. All for Sailor Mars. When you say that, I feel like I'm back at AB and you and me are doing the sing along. <laughs> I'm just sorry we had to I'm just sorry we had to subject poor roots to it though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean he knew what he was getting into. <laughs> he knew what he was getting into going to the Sailor Moon panel yeah. with us. Yeah. But going off what you said, yeah, I do agree with you. It sounded very close to the original. Maybe to the point that it kind of sounded a little deeper than the original. Especially with the transformation, yo. Yeah, I agree with that. But, but over time, I got used to it and I enjoyed the performance. Yeah, yeah the, the one thing I have to say about it was that Sailor Mars for me especially in the Japanese, when Usagi gets hurt up on the asteroid and when they're trying to revive her, she broke me. Like, Sailor Mars would break me every time, just her screaming Usagi, like, without the Chan, because, you know, they're close enough so that she doesn't never says Usagi-chan, breaks me every time. So I was really, really hoping that I would get that same kind of emotional performance from Christina V out of this. And I felt it was like a couple of steps under. Like I never got, I did, it didn't tug at my heart as much as the original. I didn't cry. So I was just, I was really, really hoping for that because that's so much of what Sailor Moon R the movie is, is about the bonds between these girls. So if you don't believe that Sailor Mars is in physical pain because Usagi is dying, like that's where I always felt it was with Sailor Mars. And I, I, I didn't feel it as much here. It was, it was fine. Like, I think it was good for her performance of it. But just comparatively to the Japanese, like, I felt like the Japanese was like a 10 and this was maybe like a seven and a half. Yeah, I can, I can understand from your point of view. I mean, to be honest, I, I can't remember if I tore, kind of tore up at that scene. I think the only time I ever really tore up when Mars was involved was when she was dying. When, what happened at the end of season one, you know, oh, yeah. with all the guardians Holy shit, man. Tears started coming down my face, man. Oh, like, that was like two episodes oh. I did not stop crying for like two episodes. I was like, it's 45 minutes. I'm still crying. Why is this happening? But I was like, oh and my no, god. And no matter how hard I tried to binge that, that episode, even the prelude to that episode it gets me emotional. You can't do it. Like, because you know what's coming if you've seen it already. And it's just like... I don't want to go there. I, I don't want everybody to die. Like I want everybody to be fine. And you know, obviously they all like get revived or whatever, but it's so hard to watch any of them die. And like, you want to feel that in the performances this time around. Now I haven't seen it. It's for the end of season one. So I can't comment, but just the one here, like I, like I said, I felt it was really good, but it wasn't like 10 out of 10 screaming usagi good like i could do it right now but i'd probably murder both of our eardrums and we don't want that so <laughs> yeah. yeah so general consensus is christina v's performance is good we're kind of mixed on if it's better or not than the original is mostly equal for the most part yeah all right so moving on now to the guardian of water and i by that i mean sailor mercury <laughs> pretty much a yes pretty much a bookworm is the brains of the team and like everybody else she has a heart for Usagi at the same time every cause here's the thing about Santa Mercury I know there's I know pretty much you don't like her but a lot of my guy friends seem to like the bookworm type and I can understand why you know I got, I got you but that's but that's neither here nor there, yeah, so pretty much 
she's pretty much the yeah like I said she's brains to the team she does her best to help her friends out of a jam when needed has a lot of compassion and even though in the 90s anime she's originally one of the weakest she is actually stronger than you might think and so Sailor Mercury is voiced by Kate Higgins and other roles you might have heard Kate Higgins in she's of course C2 or CC depending on whatever you want to call her from Code Geass she's Saber from Fate Stay Night and she's Sakura from the Naruto franchise so what are your thoughts Gigi? you know I don't like Sailor Mercury I don't like Sailor Mercury I know Sailor Mercury is, is so friggin' worthless to me. She's, like, not at Chibiusa levels of worthless, but, like, just a tiny step above Chibiusa levels of worthless. Um, Honestly, I blame that on Ikuhara, but... Yeah, yeah, like, I, I mean, it's just... Ugh. But my bias to the character aside, what did I say about Mercury? She wasn't nerdy enough. She wasn't nerdy enough. I, if you're gonna f- be a bookworm be a fucking nerd don't be like the hot sexy bookworm which I know I feel like they were trying to like pull that off here because Mercury's like not really a nerd you know what I'm saying but she is at the same time like they want to make her seem like she's normal and everything but I don't know you know me I love typecasting I wanted her to be a nerd you want to see her be more nerdy? Have you heard of the live action version of Sailor Moon? The Japanese one? Or the American one? Yeah. Um, oh, no, 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 no. The Japanese one. I don't want ever want to mention about the American one. <laughs> yeah, I've seen I like. Heard that. I've seen like 10 or 12 episodes of it, but to be quite honest with you, I don't remember it. Yeah, it is cheesy as hell, but somehow it seems to be a guilty pleasure of mine. But yeah, in that one, she's a bit more nerdy. Yeah, to, just, to the point she legitimately, she legitimately looks normal. I just... I, I wanted her to be a nerd. I wanted her to be a nerd. I mean, in the, in the nostalgia dub... Granted, I didn't like her in the nostalgia dub either, but she was way nerdier even if she sounded like an even drunker mary poppins more than luna um but i just i wasn't really feeling it now i will say this because we're not really talking about this in sailor moon crystal i felt she was a much more believable mercury than she was in this i think it has something to do with updating that character though so that mercury isn't nearly as nerdy but for here, I just, I felt that something was missing. And again, I chalked that up to Ikuhara because I know when they started producing the series originally, like, they didn't have enough of the manga content to go off, so of course that's when things start to break off. As for the dub performance, however, maybe it's just me, but I kind of find K. Higgins' performance to be kind of equal to the original i don't remember much of the original but once i heard kate higgins it's like it started to come back to me all of a sudden really that that's just my opinion you gotta remember i was very young when i started watching sailor moon i mean i i definitely see where you're where you're coming from i just i don't i don't hear it i i don't hear the original at all in her performance which is great she wants to make it her own and to which i say go for it um for me, it didn't work. That's here in this movie. It did not work for me. Mm-hmm. That's understandable. General consensus is it's a 50-50 split. I can't believe we're fighting over Sailor Mercury. You would think we would fight over Chibiusa. Jeez. I know is I got a few followers that are into Mercury for different reasons, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, she looks pretty good to me, but I'm sticking with Jupiter no matter what. (laughs) Moving on, moving on, we get to pretty much the central plot of the movie. We have Mamoru Chiba, a.k.a. Tuxedo Mask. The object of Sailor Moon's affection. 
<sighs> is and the yeah. And during the movie, he's pretty much... I want to say he wants to get caught in between Love Triangle because Fiore was a bit obsessive when he reunited with Mama. I mean, like, yeah, they they want a little something-something. They wanted it to happen. Somebody wants the to D the there. Point, he, <laughs> to the point he almost... To the point he almost killed Sailor Moon until Mama stepped in. <sighs> so... Happened? Tuxedo Mask is voiced by Robbie Damon. Other roles you've seen Robbie Damon in, he's Joe Keto from Digimon Adventure Try, Crollo Lucifer from Hunter x Hunter 2011, he's Smokey Brown from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and he's Sorvey from Tales of the. St- God damn it! <laughs> Tales of the. S- <laughs> he's Sorvey from Tales of Sisteria. Get it? Yeah. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna go last because I have certain words about this. Okay. I, I I will respect that. Tuxedo mask, my very first premiere husbando. Ugh, tuxedo mask. I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, okay, I can. So <laughs> Um, Nostalgia Dub Tuxedo Mask was awful. We'll preface that. We'll get that straight out there. Do not like yeah. Nostalgia Dub Tuxedo Mask at all. Um, Japanese Tuxedo Mask. Ho, 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 ho. However, such a contrast between the Japanese and the new dub. Like, Robbie Damon has a completely different tone of voice, which, here's my thing. When he's Mamoru, when he's Mamochan, I think Robbie Damon is fan freaking tastic. When he's Tuxedo Mask, he does something weird. And wh- what the fuck was it? Because I wrote it down. Um, <laughs> when he's Tuxedo Mask, like when he has the tuxedo on and the mask and the cape, I feel like he sounds kind of pretentious instead of like the royalty that he's going for. Like, I feel like there's this bit of a fakeness in it so that he doesn't sound like royalty, like, because Tuxedo Mask ideally is a prince and a king. I don't hear the royalty in there. I just kind of hear like he's trying to fake it. But when he's out of the cape, Robbie Damon is, oh, my God, please marry me Tuxedo Mask. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, not to say that it's bad because it's really not like I love it and I just uh, what the hell else did I say he's his tone of voice is just much higher than the original Japanese which plays the whole thing completely differently to me and it works for this dub it really does I think but I just I want to feel more sincerity from him when he's got the cape on. Yeah, that kind of leads into what I have to say because I can I can understand some of your of your points. Mm-hmm. I do think the pretentious part was it comes from all those speeches he gives every time he throws a rose down because you know <laughs> it, was, it was the nineties were a weird time. The nineties were a weird Man. time. I gotta throw that rose. Yeah. Hold on. I gotta make a speech first. I gotta make a speech first. It's not gonna make any sense. Exactly. Hold my beer. That's why I can. <laughs> that's why I can understand. It comes off a little pretentious to you. To me, uh, Robbie tends to be kind of suave, which I can appreciate in certain roles, like here and Sove was kind of weird because he played like a little kid or something like that. Uh, but his all his role in a Digimon adventure. Which I did not like. I'm just going to come out and say because this I'm never going to get a chance to mention this again. I did not like his role in Digimon Adventure Tribe because I felt in that in that show, he gave a hot butt sex voice to a guy that really didn't need it. Like, he's supposed to be a nerdy type. Oh, no. And it sounded a bit too swell for my liking. As a matter of fact, it... No offense to Robbie Damon. If I had known we were going to put movies down for the W Awards, 
I would probably would have put Joe down as my worst performance. But back on track, if you compare the two, I mean, they're both in high school and they both have kind of a secret, if you think about it. I did like him in this role. Yeah, it's a stark contrast to the original Japanese. And I know because you've met the original Japanese. Yeah. Oh, he loved me. He took a picture of my Eda bag. He posted it on yeah. Twitter. Then I freaked out in Steph's car. It was really funny. <laughs> yeah. I, but for what it's worth, I think he did a great job. I don't remember much of the original, and I probably should never remember the original. But no, don't. Rob, Robbie did a good job, regardless. And it, even if you go ahead. Yeah, and like again, like the couple episodes of Crystal that I've seen, amazing job in Crystal. So I think it has something to do with how the character of Mamoru is updated. He makes a really good updated Mamoshan. I just, I know Tuxedo Mask is a pretentious little fuck sometimes, but when he's saving Usagi, like, I want him to be that prince. I want him to, you know, whisk her away on his white horse and, like, cover in her cape and, like, take care of all her, anything that ails her. And I didn't get prince. I got duke <laughs> again the 90s were a weird time yeah, so. and speaking of whisking his girl away uh, of course we're gonna move on to the titular character of the movie sailor moon also the object of tuxedo mask's affection is the reincarnation of princess serenity and future neo queen serenity self-proclaimed guardian of love and justice would do anything to look out for her friends she may possess the strongest power in the universe and there are those willing to challenge it even if it means overcoming things with the power of love and friendship i believe this is where the trope might have got gotten started but that's anybody's guess and so sailor moon is voiced by stephanie shea Stephanie Shea, other roles you've seen her in. She's of course Oihime from Bleach. She's Hinata from the Naruto franchise. She's Ereka from Ereka 7. Nui Harume from Kill la Kill. And Akira Kogami from Lucky Star. And judging by the quietness in the background, I sense you have some words, Gigi. I do have words. And then I was totally about to go into it. And then all that came at my head was, I am the terror that flaps in the night. And I was like, this is not fucking Darkwing Duck. <laughs> I was going to do the whole thing. And then all of a sudden it came out of my mouth. I am the terror that flaps. No, that's not right. I fight for love and justice. I am Sailor Moon. Tsukini Kawate. Ashokyo. Yeah, that didn't happen here. Um, So... I'm uh, ooh, that spiked my levels real bad. Sorry, friends. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I know what I think, but it it, I don't I don't want to be mean, Gigi. I mean, I don't want to. You know what I'm saying? Like, here's my thing. First of all, I'm just gonna start out by saying it straight up. You guys know how I feel about little kid voice Monica Rial. I feel like Stephanie Shea is the West Coast version of Monica Rial. I think her portrayal of Usagi is squeaky. I think it hurts me to listen to it. I'm so sorry. Um, I think a lot of it is all one note, especially during her attacks and during her transformation sequences. Sailor Moon has, like, a lot of speeches also, just like Tuxedo Mask. But I, like, her speeches meant something to me when I was a kid. They meant something that I wanted to run around with my friends and pretend that we were all Sailor Senshi and shout them like we were fighting bad guys. They mean something to me. And in this performance, I, I don't get 
I, I don't get it. I, I just don't understand it. I understand where they're coming from from casting her because she does have the squeaky properties of her voice that the original Japanese dub has. Nostalgia dub aside, that Sailor Moon voice was in its own freaking stratosphere. Like, I can't even compare it to anything because, number one, I think like three different actresses played her. So I don't want to get them mixed up and then stick my foot in my mouth. Um, but just between this and the Japanese, they are very similar tonal wise. And I do think that Japanese Usagi is, again, very high pitched and very squeaky, which ideally I wouldn't like. But I guess because I'm so used to it and that I I went into it knowing that that was how it was going to be, that it was okay and I felt the passion behind everything in the Japanese even when they say you know in the name of the moon I'll punish you 200 times I still got it every single time and here I just I couldn't um like when she was sad when she was hurt I didn't believe her tears when she was screaming in pain. Now this might be a mixing thing, but I felt it needed to be a lot louder. Um, I will say this when she speaks very softly and very like princess serenity, very Neo queen serenity ish. Um, that's when I felt her. It has some kind of, she put some kind of weird, I don't know if it was in there mixed in or that's her actual voice where there's some kind of filter on it but when she spoke softly that's when I got it I was like okay and that was at a point where I really needed to get it because you know she's trying to keep the asteroid from falling into the earth and she's holding on to the he's she's holding on to Fiore to try and get him to understand her and that was where she needed to have that tone of voice and she Stephanie Shane knocked it out of the park um but other than that, I just, I can't get, I can't get behind her as Sailor Moon. I can't, I can't do it. I don't know why. I just, this is a totally personal thing that I can't get behind her as Sailor Moon. Yeah, don't worry, tuxedo mask can get behind her. Oh! <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a little inappropriate of me. <laughs> We're, we're on we're on dub talk when is it ever appropriate <laughs> oh god yeah i could un- i can understand what you were saying because to be honest i again i don't remember much of the old dub but i did hear people talk about the original dub at least the original deep dub that the sailor moon there she was kind of yodeling her attacks yeah it was so, weird at least so at least on that front, Stephanie Shea is already a step ahead. And as for the rest of the performance, I don't think she sounded a bit one though. Like there was certain there was certain times when she would speak, even in the regular series, there'd be certain times she'd speak that you can hear her just talk normally. Most of the time she's saying something dumb or just trying to be friendly with others, but you know, that's what happens when you try to retrofit new actors into an old series you know nothing's ever gonna quite line up right yeah it's just uh, i mean i feel terrible for saying it but you know how i feel about squeaky kid voice monica real and this is the same for me but on the west coast i can't get behind it i can't do it i'm the only one who feels this way I am, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's understandable. It's understandable, you know. It's not everybody's cup of tea. And I know, not going to name names, but I know some people kind of find the character acceptable, regardless of whatever performance you may give them. But I think, I don't know, maybe it's just a kid to me, but I think Usagi is kind of a self-insert character, you know, so... Maybe like when you're portraying it as a as trying to portray a teenager, you know, 
kids can be a bit annoying, believe me, I know. But sometimes teenagers can also be a bit annoying too, so I think she kind of nailed it in that regard a little bit. Yeah, it's just, LA dopes can be a little bit trying in general. See, and I didn't, I didn't feel that she was annoying at all. Like, actually, the Sailor Moon R movie in comparison to every other Sailor Moon thing ever, this is probably Sailor Moon at her least annoying. And I didn't feel that it, her performance was annoying. I didn't feel like Sailor Moon was annoying. I just felt it was for most of the attacking, which this movie has a lot of fight scenes. I just felt it was yeah. very one note. Like, I wouldn't want to run around with my friends screaming it. I just wouldn't want to do it. Hmm. Please say something good. Because I feel... I I, I haven't I, I heard know. Stephanie I'm not, I'm not tr- in a lot of other things. So, I, I don't... Nah. I can't compare her to anything else. Because I haven't really heard her in a lot. I just... I... I I don't know. I well, let me let me say let me try to fix that a little bit. I because I have met Steph Shade twice already. I feel I feel like in terms of the performance, you know, the direction can only be given in a certain way depending on I guess how it was in the Japanese. So maybe if the, it was a little annoying in the Japanese, she they were trying to make it a little annoying in English. You know, trying to almost trying to make it one for one, if you will. But other than that, she did a good job nonetheless compared to the original dub. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Compared to the original, which was... Oh, what a mess. Sailor Moon says. But, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, re- and I like on that. On the- <laughs> yeah. Again, the 90s I wanted were Sailor weird. Moon to tell me some life lessons. I wanted some life lessons from Sailor Moon. Like, don't touch the hot stove. Yeah. Don't cross the street. Don't take candy from strangers. And speaking of life lessons, I think it's time to move into final thoughts. <laughs> so. <laughs> As a whole, what did you think of the movie entirely? Well, like I started at the beginning, this movie is a huge nostalgia trip for me. I've seen it so many times. I couldn't even tell you how many times I've seen this movie. Um, And to watch it remastered for the first time, I didn't get to see it at the theater. So I watched my Blu-ray copy that I bought. Um, So uh, as for the dub of it, I, uh, if I have the choice, I'm going to watch it in the Japanese every time just because as soon as I learned how to read, basically I was reading the subtitles for this movie. Like I, it means so much to me and is such a part of growing up that that's what I remember it with. Um, the, I think the dub tried their best to both be faithful to the original, especially in the directing and the writing um, as well as put have everybody's own spin on it. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, but if I have the choice between watching, you know, nostalgia dub, new dub, or Japanese, I- I'm going to pick the Japanese. But not to say that it's awful. Like I was honestly, honestly, I was expecting it to be awful. And it, it wasn't. So I'm very grateful. And I'm grateful for Viz picking it up and doing everything they're doing with the Sailor Moon franchise right now. It, in the dub, I'd give it a solid 7 out of 10. If I rank the Japanese a 10 out of 10, I'd give it a solid 7. Understood. As for me, this was actually, in my entirety, this was actually the first time I've ever seen the movie. So I was pretty much amazed and maybe slightly disappointed but it that's because it mostly it's a product of his time and again you're trying to retrofit something new into something old something's bound to be lost in translation whether it's the directing a little bit the writing the voices who knows at least we know now that 
a movie like this can age well if given the right treatment. Except for that awful CGI asteroid, though. Let's not even talk about it, that. It was 1993. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, then. And on that note, it's time to end. If you want to watch Sailor Moon or the movie, it's available now at Right Stuff, Best Buy, or wherever you buy your anime. There's also a digital version available in the Xbox and PlayStation Store. As for the rest of the series, you can buy the classic series, which is dubbed up to Season 3 on Blu-ray and DVD, as well as Crystal, which is up to Season 2. The show is also available digitally on Xbox and PlayStation, as well as Hulu, Yahoo View, and Viz, with all five seasons of the classic available subbed and dubbed up to Season 2 for some reason. Just know with Hulu, you get a month free trial depending on if you want to watch with limited or no commercials. If after one month you do not want to continue, make sure you cancel because a credit card is required to set up and they will pull money out of your account. As for us and our shenanigans, Gigi, why don't you give yourself a plug? <laughs> My name is Gigi. You can follow me on Twitter or on YouTube at Anime Palooza. When I am not doing unboxings of the ridiculous amount of Yuri on Ice merchandise that I buy or talking about shoujo trash, you can find me over on Twitter posting fan art of beautiful things because that's how I like to live my life and um, talking about my waifu, Sailor Uranus, which hopefully we'll get to talk about coming up eventually, hopefully. Yeah, it might be. That might be for another day. Might be for another day. Not saying anything. Not saying anything. Wink, wink. Wink, wink. <laughs> Throws <laughs> glitter. <laughs> sparkle, sparkle. <laughs> as for me, <laughs> as for me, I'm an assistant editor for the Dub Talk podcast. I can be found on my other channel, Jamstar One, which is collecting dust in terms of content. I have a blog, which is also collecting dust in terms of content. <laughs> Not really doing much at the moment right now. Come to our panel you at a Fest, please, please come to our panel. Yes, we'll let you know Dub when Talk it is. Be, Dub Talk will be at a Fest in uh when when is it again? August seventeenth, I believe. We we will uh, the weekend of August seventeenth. Yep, in Texas. So come and see us. Come yeah. say hi, and we will have a panel. As soon as we get details about it, we will definitely post it for you all to enjoy. And we will be recording it in case you can't make it down to Texas so you can see it on our channel. And Jamal, why don't you tell everybody about the channel? Yes, as for our channel, you know, the thing you're watching this episode on, we are on YouTube at The Talk Podcast. We can also be found on social media by the same name at on Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. Oh, we have a Facebook now? Make sure... I think so. <laughs> Shit. I know. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll post it in the description later. Sounds good. Yeah, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And I think that's it from both of us here. And from here at Dub Talk, we wish you a good night. Love your faces! And we'll talk you on. In the name of the moon, we will punish you. But not that bad because <laughs> we love you. No, you're all good people. Thank you for watching. Good night, everybody.